This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. In a previous lecture, we looked at demand curves and supply curves and argued how the demand and supply, the quantities demanded and supplied, will hit an equilibrium at a particular price. And at that price, everyone is kind of happy. Uh, people who want the goods enough are prepared to pay that price uh, and their requirement for the goods is perfectly matched by the supply of those goods uh, and it produces a, a very efficient allocation uh, of uh, products. However, there are certain circumstances where the market mechanism breaks down and markets do not function correctly. And the first is a monopoly. And a monopoly occurs where there is only one supplier. And if there's only one supplier, then of course this person could simply refuse to increase uh, the output of goods uh, and therefore could artificially hold the price much, much higher than it normally would have been. If other people could come into the market if the price was high, that would suck other suppliers into the market and the price would go down until we had supply meeting demand. Uh, but a monopolist can hold the price artificially high uh, and, uh, if you like, restrict the, the product only to people who are willing to pay an excessively high price for it. Types of monopolies, you can have true monopolies. Uh, for example, if you take over all your rivals and you end up being the only supplier, or maybe you have a patent uh, and no one else can make this valuable product that you can make, you have a true uh, monopoly. Uh, another type of monopoly is a natural monopoly. Uh, there's nothing actually stopping other people coming in except very high fixed costs. Uh, for example, at, at one time, uh, the telephone uh, system was essentially a natural monopoly uh, because once one company had set up the telephone system, uh, if another rival was going to set up, they would have to dig up all the roads, put wires into everybody's house and apartment and so on. There'd be a fantastically high initial cost only to then share for hang on a half the market. Now, whatever causes a monopoly, uh, it, it, it is usually bad for the consumer uh, because it means that, as I say, prices are artificially high, there's going to be uh, demand which hasn't been met uh, and, and, and so on. It, it enriches the supplier. The supplier can be very inefficient, very uh, bad at using the resources, very wasteful. Uh, their, their costs can be high, but because they keep the price even higher, they're, they're still making a, a decent profit. Competition drives down prices and makes people efficient. Competition also uh, allows innovation. You will want to make a better product than your competitors uh, so that you can win customers. A monopolist doesn't have to do any of that. You can turn out the same old rubbish year after year and charge a high price. As well as uh, monopolies, uh, uh, there are other uh, types of uh, practice which can harm consumers. Uh, for example, cartels. This is where several suppliers get together and basically price fix. So, so at the end of the day, they're all getting higher prices than they need to uh, or would have had they been properly competing. Predatory pricing uh, is where a relatively rich supplier drops their price maybe by 50% uh, and be, and even though they're making a loss maybe because they've got lots of money in the bank they can sustain this loss for six months uh, but other suppliers who are in a weaker financial position uh, if they were to match that price and make a loss then, then they would go bankrupt. So it's driving people out of the market by this very aggressive pricing. Tide selling is where a producer uh, uh, says to a retailer, for example, you can only sell my products. And if you're uh, saying an agreement with the supplier, you can only sell my products, 
and you will sell them at $20 a unit, uh, then it is very difficult for competing products to get into the market uh, uh, and it's going to be restricting choice and going to be keeping prices high. And finally, market allocation. Uh, this is where a number of companies say, right, I'll sell in the United Kingdom and France. You can sell in Germany and in Switzerland and so on. Uh, so it's almost creating monopolies uh, ruled by different suppliers in different countries uh, and, and prevents true uh, competition. Governments see monopolies and restrictive trade practices as bad for consumers and they bring in laws to prevent it. So in the UK we have the or Monopolies and Mergers Commission or equivalent uh, uh, organisations like, like that which looks carefully at the market positions of companies, how much of the market they control, whether they control too much or too powerful and its ability to set prices or to go for predatory pricing. Uh, they, oft, they also look at takeovers. So if you've got three companies supplying the whole market and two of them want to combine, thereby bringing the competition down to just two, uh, that will probably be stopped uh, because it's not in the interest of consumers to have only two uh, competitors. Public goods. Public goods, the name of a public good or the definition of a public good is where one individual can consume without reducing uh, supply to other individuals and for which no one is excluded. Uh, a good example here is street lighting. So uh, the council puts up the street lighting, uh, everyone uh, enjoys or has benefit from the street lighting because I can see where I'm going in the street at night doesn't stop anyone else uh, seeing where they're going at night and so on. To a large extent uh, roads are uh, uh, also public goods although when they get very crowded that may break down but defence and law enforcement uh, the defence of the country if you like uh, simply because I'm defended by the army it doesn't mean that my neighbour gets less defence from the army and so on uh, and these are uh, public goods. They are non-rivalous uh, I am not competing with my neighbour to consume on this. They are non-excludable. You can't leave someone out of this here, even if they don't really want to partake in it. Everyone is covered by the defence system, if you like. Everybody uh, uh, enjoys street lighting, whether or not they, they want to uh, uh, do that. Uh, and the problem that can come from this is the, the, what's called this free rider uh, problem. People might be enjoying the resource of street lighting, but are they paying for it? Because they can't be excluded from it. You can't insist that somebody who's not paying for street lighting goes out with dark glasses on or something of that, that sort. So some people enjoy the benefit of public goods without properly contributing uh, to their cost. And also the final thing is they're considered to be non-rejectable. So even if you don't agree with, say, the nuclear deterrent, if you live in the UK, you are nevertheless uh, potentially benefiting from the nuclear deterrent. Externalities. An externality is a cost or benefit that affects a party who did not choose to incur that cost or benefit. An example of a, an externality uh, would be, say, uh, near an airport, you have aircraft noise. So you're living near the airport and your enjoyment of life is decreased because of these jets whining over during the day and so on. You are suffering. You, you, there's a cost there. It's, it's not a monetary cost particularly, uh, although it may affect the price of your house, of course. There could be a monetary cost, but you're certainly suffering. Uh, and to what extent is the airline or the airport, are they compensating you for that suffering? Or perhaps uh, it is uh, a lot of delivery vehicles.
tune. You live near a, a big warehouse. The delivery vehicles going in and out. They clog up the roads. They create dust and noise and so on. Uh, the warehouse, the supermarket, whoever owns the warehouse, is enjoying the warehouse and the roads and, and so on. Uh, but maybe it's not properly compensating you for the extra bother. Those are both examples of negative externalities. You can also have positive externalities. And the great example of a positive externality, and it's mentioned in the notes, uh, are bees. Uh, and bees, uh, of course, kept uh, for their honey. We're talking about here uh, commercial uh, beekeepers uh, who have lots of hives around the, the countryside uh, and they produce honey. But of course the bees collect the honey from flowers and blossoms and as they collect the honey from flowers and blossoms they pollinate crops. But the farmers uh, are not paying for that. They get this benefit, they get much higher crop yields uh, because there are bees kept there. Uh, the beekeeper of course gets money for the honey but the bee beekeeper doesn't share in any of the profits of the, the farms. And if the price of honey were to drop so that there were fewer beekeepers, fewer bees and so on, then perhaps the yield from farms would decrease. Uh, and that may be a disadvantage to the country. So what you can do in both of these cases, you can, uh, for example, maybe have some sort of government payment, government scheme, where you subsidise beekeeping to encourage more people to do it, to make it a more profitable uh, 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 pursuit. Uh, and you could even tax farmers to say, right, you are using bees. They are not, you are benefiting from bees. They're not your bees, but we'll take a certain amount of money from you based on the crop weight and we'll pay it to beekeepers into a kind of a fund. Similarly, uh, you can uh, artificially or, or uh, kind of compensate people for a negative externality so what the government could do is to say, right, everyone who lives within five kilometres of this airport, we are going to pay them a certain amount per annum uh, to compensate for the noise. Uh, and the government could tax the airport, tax the airlines for that, uh, to ensure there was a transfer of value from those enjoying uh, the benefit or being able to land at the airport to those who are suffering from this externality uh, from noise and pollution. And then the final term I think we have is one of merit goods uh, applied to a commodity or service such as education that's regarded by society uh, or the government as being very worthwhile uh, even though it's hard to see a direct benefit. No one is getting a direct benefit. So we know that education is a good thing. We know that long-term education it's going to increase the technical ability of the population. It's going to help the country compete in the world and so on there. Uh, uh, but it's very difficult to know how you would charge for that or, or how you would subsidize this on a commercial sort of a basis. And this is where uh, government comes in with public finance. Uh, the government says it's very difficult to, to measure how an individual actually benefits from education, for example. So what we'll do uh, is we will raise taxes in general and some of these taxes we will pay to schools, universities, uh, and this will uh, make sure that there's an, enough education uh, to benefit society at large, a merit good. Governments sometimes try to set both minimum prices and maximum prices. Uh, so we're setting a minimum price. So we're saying that maybe uh, for, let's say, one loaf, uh, then the minimum price is, let's say, going to be euros five. And that's quite, that's quite a high minimum price uh, for a loaf of bread. So uh, the suppliers are guaranteed they're going to get five euros a loaf. Uh, they're going to be uh, attracted into this market because it's such a lucrative market, uh, even though, of course, consumers won't want to buy very much at five euros a loaf because it's quite expensive. So what we're going to get here is overproduction. Lots and lots of loaves are going to be supplied at five, but relatively few 
uh, are going to be bought at five because because this is kept artificially high. So the overproduction, too many producers in there, and it's terribly wasteful of, of, of resources because in a way you're subsidizing these goods. It's inefficient on production. If you're guaranteed to be making five euros per loaf, well, you might put the, the cost of production through very sloppy, bad, inefficient production. It might be four euros per loaf. Uh, but if you really tried hard, you might get it down to two euros per loaf. But, but you're surviving. Uh, you're surviving with this inefficient production uh, because the price is so high. And of course, people can't just refuse to buy some of these goods. You have to buy food. Uh, and even if the prices are kept artificially high, you will stop buying other products and you will divert your income to pay for this artificially highly priced uh, produce. Maximum prices. So let's say that we put a maximum price uh, 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 here. Again, I say a loaf of bread. Let's say one euro. That one euro is probably quite cheap for a loaf of bread. So this will increase demand. Uh, a loaf of bread, perhaps its natural price is about two euros, but you bring it down to one euro. People go out and kind of buy loaves of bread they don't really need. Uh, they'll, they'll light the fire with them, really, because it's probably cheaper than, 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 than coal or wood uh, and, and so on there. Uh, but if the supplier is only getting one euro, if there's been a price cap put on, uh, then, of course, the supply of the goods is going to be very low. And we have much, uh, a lot of excess demand here. Demand will begin to exceed uh, supply, uh, as there's no price mechanism to succeed this. Demand will be higher and higher and higher, but the supply will stay very low because the suppliers aren't getting very much from this. So if there's very high demand and very low supply, how do we match the quantities? Because the price mechanism isn't going to bring it into any form of equilibrium. And the ways you can bring it into uh, uh, equilibrium is to ration. Tell everyone you can only buy one loaf of bread at one euro per week. So so even though the uh, price is, is, is held low, the maximum price is low, uh, you say you can only buy one per week and that could be something which then matches the supply with this very low demand. Or, or you queue. So there's a great queue going down the street waiting for loaves of bread at one euro each uh, and uh, you know people will go away, they'll give up on it and so on. Uh, people will go to the bakery and they'll find at the end of the queue when they get to the front that there's nothing there and so on. So that's not, not a great experience either. Or another uh, uh, way, kind of like rationing here, uh, is uh, giving people uh, vouchers. So you give somebody a voucher, which allows them one loaf per, per, per week or per day, whatever it's going to be. Uh, and when they're paying, they have to produce one of these vouchers. And that's going to be controlling the, uh, the, the amount which is supplied and demanded, but very artificially, not using the price mechanism.